Well, welcome everyone to the Environment Workshop as part of uh, version two of the Robotics Roadmap for Australia. My name's Sue Kay and I'm the Research Director for Cyber Physical Systems with CSIRO's Data61 and was an architect of the first version of the Robotics Roadmap for Australia. Before we start, I'd like, like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the different lands on which we are all meeting today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Well, this was the first version of the Robotics Roadmap that was released in mid-2018. And at the time, it was a first attempt to try and map out the capability that we have in robotics in Australia, but also to have a look at the potential impacts that robotics was going to have on different sectors that are important to Australia. And as part of that, we came up with a whole range of recommendations. This is just a very short summary of some of those. And one of them that I think is quite pertinent to today's workshop is that final one around um, our culture. And that is how we can harness the nation's imagination through aspirational challenges, you know, and solving Australia's, you know, big problems. And I think none of those problems are more acute than many of the problems that we face when trying to look at how we can preserve our, um, our unique heritage and environment. Uh, so today's topic is really around how we apply robotics to the environment and importantly, how robotics can be used to not only uh, protect the environment, but also potentially to remediate the environment. And you're going to be hearing from a range of speakers who will show you different ways that robotics is currently being applied. So the reason that we're undertaking this second version of the Robotics Roadmap for Australia, first is to keep the momentum going. The first roadmap, um, I think, was reasonably successful in starting to raise the profile of robotics in Australia. And uh, hopefully we can build on that momentum and really keep it at the forefront of many people's minds. I think it's also important to help encourage the right skills development. I think there's still a lot of confusion around you know, the type of career pathways that our young people can expect in the future. And that is an area that we can certainly make a difference. I think it's also about identifying where Australia can make a difference. We can't boil the ocean. And so there are areas, I think, where we have particular niche capabilities, environmental robotics being one, that we can really make a big difference. The other really important thing is about keeping unearthing capability. And so I'm very excited about the presentations that we're going to hear today because that's doing exactly that. It's actually showcasing some of the fantastic examples of where people are applying robotics to help solve environmental challenges today. And finally, you know, the, the main goal uh, of all of this is hopefully that we will be able to establish a clearly recognised robotics industry in Australia that is successful and sustainable and helps the country in many different ways. Because we've had to move to a virtual format uh, because of the current pandemic, um, it does mean that we feel we probably have lost some of the opportunity for connections with all of you, our participants, to um, allow you to have your say in what potentially goes into the roadmap. So we have constructed a survey that, that we have the link there. You can also get the link from the Robotics Australia Network website. And we encourage you to participate uh, answer the questions as part of the survey and really give us your views on what needs to be in the roadmap and any fantastic examples of the applications of robotics that you know of in uh, Australia. So today we have a pretty packed agenda. So uh, first off, we are going to be hearing from Andy Dunstan from Queensland Parks and Wildlife. Oops, sorry, just skip the slide. Uh, then we'll be seeing some examples of environmental robotics from Matt Dunbabin from QUT. Brian Okusi and Brett Kettle from CSIRO. Then we'll hear more from Stefan Williams, University of Sydney, Lashika Medagoda from uh, um, Abyss Solutions and Rob Fitch from UTS. Before we actually encourage you to join us in a participatory activity on a Miro board where you can give us some of your ideas online. I'd like to thank my co-chairs in putting this workshop together and in helping to write the environment uh, chapter of the robotics roadmap, Matt Dunbabin from QUT, Stefan Williams from the University of Sydney and Andreas Maruchis from CSIRO. And once again, please fill in the survey if you get the opportunity. And we encourage you to use the chat and Q&A function on the webcast. But 
I'd love to get started now and to introduce you to Andy Dunstan um, from Queensland Parks and Wildlife. Thank you, Andy. Uh, thank you, Sue. I'll share a, uh, oh, let's do that a better, shall we? Uh, yes. How's that coming up? It's great. Just need to go into slide view. Perfect. Yep. Okay. That's great. And um, yes, yeah, so you may get the lovely tones of the airport calling system in the background here. But, uh, we can only hope. So yes, talking about the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, and the good news is it's um, officially been recognised the need for technology and a tra technology transformation program, both in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority and Queensland Parks and Wildlife. And that's who uh, I work for. Um, but yes, working very closely alongside Matt Dunbabin at QUT um, and others. So it's it's a very much partnership sort of thing, recognising we don't necessarily have these um, skills within our department. Uh, but our general reason for being is um, to provide a joint field management program for the Great Barrier Reef, huge area, a um, few main areas of operation with compliance, monitoring, general management and operations and actions, and then response to incidents that happen on the reef. But that's such a broad area that I thought I'd just talk about what I'm very familiar with, which is at Rain Island, where we've really innovated a lot of the technology and tried a lot of the tech, new technology out up there and um, it's developing very nicely. Um, it's a really important place. It's a nesting site for 90% of the northern Great Barrier Reef green turtle population. It's the largest remaining green turtle rookery on the planet by far and it's the most in, important seabird nesting area in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. So it's an amazing place. It's right up in the very, very far north of the Great Barrier Reef and just off the edge of the reef, coming up straight up out of about 300 metres of water to a large reef in a small coral sand cave. So being that it is that scenario where it's, it's very remote, it's expensive to get there by, and we don't have any research base on the island, so it's really going there on a liveaboard boat. And that, because of that, you're really only getting small snapshots in time when you can have field trips to the location and seriously harsh environmental extremes. If you uh, want to test any electronic gear, send it to Rain Island. Guaranteed to test it right out. So the sort of things that we're doing up there to really knowing that we want to have a, a view and a monitoring and an understanding of the place year round is to put um, cameras there still, day and night cameras, so they'll shoot right through the through the low light and the, and the evening, um, pan zoom tilt video cameras, um, using satellite connectivity and Wi-Fi on the island to be able to link to those from back at the desk, and um, and also weather stations and environmental sensors, uh, and then while we're there, using drones and a range of other tools as well. So you know, recognising that a few field trips a year is not good enough and that this can potentially uh, solve some of those problems. So this is actually footage from the still camera right through the night. So this is a full night of time lapse of turtle nesting. They're not actually that fast. And uh, there's, uh, there's some serious numbers of turtles at this island. So, you know, on a lap of the island, which is only about two kilometres around, the most turtles I've ever counted is uh, 23,000. So totally virtually no sand at that stage. But so to be able to do that, yes, we can do counts, we can have snapshots in time, but with these cameras, we're recording right through the whole season. Every three minutes, we're taking a photograph, or in fact, we're taking four photos because we need to bracket those um, with a very nice setup that Matt Dunbabin has helped to create there with um, Raspberry Pi controllers and Wi-Fi setups to be able to um, control the camera and push information back to home base and store lots of information. Uh, but then also going through to optimise those images and be able to do automated turtle counts of the nesting beach. And 
I think as well, if you go back to here, our next phase of that will be to actually have a look at this um, scenario and be able to interpret the behaviour of the turtles and whether they're actually successfully nesting um, or not, which is an important element. And also a number of turtles do get stranded at the end of the day or at the end of the nesting night, don't get back to the water and do die on the beach. So we can keep track of that and potentially do something automated with that side. Another element we do there is doing mark resite, where we paint 200 turtles on the night and then the next day we'll go through and uh, next three days we'll go and count how many tur painted turtles, how many unpainted turtles. The ratio gives us a mark resite population estimate of the total turtles around the island, um, of which there are a few. So this is uh, pretty serious numbers of turtles. And to do an automated analysis of the drone footage blown at 50 metres um, has worked very nicely. So you can see here, turtles being identified automatically, the trails behind them are such that the turtle is given a direction when it seems if it does disappear or go deeper and it re-emerges, it won't be counted twice. You can see the yellow boxes around the painted turtles. So it's identifying a turtle first and then identifying if it's painted or not. Um, and so that's been a really successful thing. And it's, it's with a lot of this robotics and AI, it's all about becoming more efficient, more accurate, and reducing risk to people in the workplace out there too, some harsh environments. And another element is, um, you know, the most important seabird nesting place. There's two species that don't nest anywhere else on the barrier reef. There's eight really key important species here. We've gone through, this is a ortho mosaic from five and a half thousand drone photos. Um, and then going through and identifying each individual bird and species from there to be able to then do the machine learning and training to uh, develop automated count process for those species. Uh, and really, this is key for seabirds because it just hasn't been any really good ability to count and do census of seabirds in the past. You can imagine disturbance as you're walking through or trying to. Uh, trying to count them and put, bring seabirds off chicks or eggs is, uh, you know, brings on the mortality there. But this is the drone shot. This is from, you know, a zoomed in image. From there, this is a very zoomed in image. So the resolution is magnificent. And then this is the counting of the uh, adult frigate birds and not counting in this one of the, uh, the adolescent frigate birds, the fledglings. So we can actually, uh, um, differentiate between the two. So it's been a, a really great balance of a whole range of things. We're looking forward to a time we might have the drone in a box out there where we can get this data, you know, through the whole season as well. Uh, but yeah, we're building up that again with the weather data, with the environmental sensors, with the imagery, and then having it all talk to each other. So in summary, yeah, with the automated analysis of the image data sets, yes, we've got great mark resite population counts, getting there very well with the nesting turtle counts and also the multi-species nesting seabird census. Uh, next cab off the rank is looking at turtle behaviour automatically. Um, our issues have been getting some standardised image collection methods and having equipment not die at Rain Island in the heat and the um, and, and the rain and the salt and the um, microscopic dusty bird poo, um, and then you know to be able to link all the different elements together, so you've got integrated storage and workflow from all the data. So that's our challenges that are ahead. Uh, but yes, so it's been a, a great start. So thanks very much. Thanks very much, Andy. And um, hopefully you'll have time before your flight to watch the rest of the presentations. And we're going to save the Q&A until the end of the presentations, depending on how we're going for time. So thanks again for the presentation. Very good. Thank you, Sue. Now I'm going to hand over to Matt Dunbabin from QT, who has put together a compilation of some of the different uh, applications of robots to the environment.
Okay, thank you, Sue. So I think you, you hit the nail on the head in your opening discussion regarding we need to harness the capabilities um, of Australian researchers. Um, but I, I think as a nation, we've done really well to lead the world in this space, particularly for environmental robotics, because we never really had that defence money that some of the other countries have. So our application focus has been on this great country and what we can do, the novel uses of robotic systems to address a heap of challenges. So what I wanted to do, I've reached out to a few colleagues um, just to share some videos. So this by far is not exhaustive, but um, just to give an idea of some of the um, sort of the breadth of work that the, we're doing here in Australia. So hopefully you can see this video. And it's going to run slow now. Great. Okay. So this is from the University of Tasmania. They, they're currently working down in Antarctica using drones. Um, this is work from QUT, actually, from colleagues doing automated koala population counts using drones. And he's just shown some of this work on automated turtle counting. Um, our CSIRO has been working actually in the Amazon um, doing uh, legged robots, got robots that go around doing uh, different types of assessments, pesticide management uh, and weed management for that. Uh, legged robot is from the University of Sydney. Um, so this is just a quick snapshot of a whole heap of different things. It's quite broad, climbing robots. Just to give the idea that we, we work from everywhere from the Great Barrier Reef down to Antarctica. We, we look at the domains of air, um, sea, terrestrial, um, and we get all sorts of important information. And we're, we're learning to do things like um, well, this my particular work, like County Crown of Thorns starfish. We've got CSI Road that run uh, some gliders, uh, do seagrass mapping. Um, this is some uh, work that's just recently been done by Ames up on the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, using some autonomous surface vessels to do um, automated toes, video toes. Um, we've been trialling other people's technologies for them, uh, sail drones. That's what they're good for, these harsh environments. Uh, Stefan Williams' work uh, is very renowned in the, the high-resolution imaging space, and it's just some examples of what you get to see while you're, you're floating around there. Um, we're going from everywhere from monitoring to management, uh, and this is just last bit, this is actually restoring. So there's some work on restoring coral reefs at large scale. Um, so that's just a very quick snapshot of some of the work that we do. We do a lot more, obviously, in Australia with drones and other things. Um, but hopefully it gives a bit of a background into some of the other uh, presentations you'll see, and the opportunities that we have to, um, to exploit these types of technologies. I'll stop sharing. Um, I'll leave it at that. Great, thanks, Matt. And to follow up on Matt's presentation, we have some more examples of the application of environmental robotics. Um, and so I would like to invite Brian O'Cousy and Brett Kettle to give us an insight into their field work just last week up at Heron Island. Thanks, Sue, and uh, welcome everybody to our bit. Um, so Matt gave an really cool overview of the whole landscape. And we'd just like to add to it a little small thing that only just got tested as soon, uh, you know, three days ago in the field trip. Um, so, uh, Brad, do you want to say a few things before we start? Uh, only that the concept arose a couple of years back with um, thoughts about the uh, Manitou process, which is a conventional broad scale process. But look, the, uh, the video here is actually uh, annotated, so we're just going to kind of let it speak to itself so that the time runs about on time. Hi, uh, here to talk to you today about Vertigo 3, a new class of underwater robot. Let's deal with the logo first. It's uh, clearly designed to be a high performance aeroplane. Uh, by which we mean three axis controls along with flap um, working underwater, sensing the bottom primarily by vision and uh, producing um, interpreted data as it goes. Uh, whole purpose of it is for broad scale uh, survey. Reefs, yes, shallow waters in general, uh, more specifically replacing the old Mandato method, which was invented 51 years ago. Let me just clarify that there's already three classes of underwater uh, vehicles at the moment. TUVs, towed, brick on a string. ROVs, 
uh, robot on a string, sluggish robot on a string, and AUVs, uh, sluggish robots without strings. And uh, Vertigo 3 kind of blends the best of all of these. We've very deliberately opted to use a cable to tow the glider with, and that provides three things, overcomes the three critical issues for broad scale work underwater. One, it allows us to geolocate. Two, provides the great majority of the propulsion force. And three, it provides all the communications bandwidth we need for performing uh, you know, high, high performance computing uh, on the surface using the information as it's coming in. Because of all of that, we can build something that's very, very fast, you know, agile and small, and therefore allows us to operate in topographically complex uh, regions such as bombies and coral reefs. Multiple use cases, it was originally conceived for crown thorn starfish management, uh, but equally applicable to a whole range of other um, search, um, hunting, you know, searching, uh, surveying, censusing, stock assessments, etc. Uh, the data management side of it, the primary vision stream is 15 frames a second, 5 megapixels per frame, plus a whole bunch of associated um, IMU data and uh, glider performance data, all of which is um, archived, stored and archived, and uh, every, every pixel is available for the future. Meaning that using the glider and collecting this type of data, we can actually answer questions in the future which we have never contemplated today. It's very unlike any of the current monitoring techniques which are used. Uh, the other thing, of course, is a lot of the money that gets spent on this is public money, and in this sense, the work of this is fully auditable. We just got back from a 10-day trip to the Great Barrier Reef, um, did a whole bunch of work on flight path control and things like that. But at the same time, we took the chance to go and survey Fitzroy Reef, 24 kilometres of uh, around the reef edge, including a number of places where we towed at multiple depths. Um, in about three hours, a uh, little over three hours, Fitzroy Reef Shoal, uh, down to 20 metres water depth on the edge of the shoal uh, in under half an hour. Llewellyn Reef, two hours and six minutes to tow the entire reef. Lamont Reef, uh, back reef area, 40 minutes to tow, uh, 4.7 kilometres. And you can see from the moving video there that we're, uh, we're identifying um, animals, particularly crown starfish in this case, uh, for our training purposes. The other things that the yeah. glider is, is good at and we are building ML capabilities for is uh, animal detection and counting. So, you know, species detection and counting. Uh, we have starfish tracking already operating in an embedded sense for starfish in Moreton Bay. We also do cover estimation. You can see an example here of a paper which is just going to press as we speak, which looks at um, multi species classifications of seagrasses in Moreton Bay. And you can see from that imagery, we're getting quite good um, test results there with 88% uh, 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 recall and precision for um, uh, our poorest species, which is the rounded uh, types of seagrasses, um, but generally high 90% for, uh, for seagrasses in general. Um, and given that uh, we are analysing this every 15 centimetres or so, it uh, gives us a very, very high precision in terms of our community estimates. Um, the other thing, of course, is the fact that we are running video allows us to do things which haven't been um, able to do in the past. So, for example, tracking the movement of fishes and stuff like that uh, frame to frame allows us to identify and segment for training purposes, but also for ecological purposes counting. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sue. Thanks very much, Bruno and Brett. And uh, we are making people uh, wait for a little while before there's any Q&A. So um, there might be some questions, so be prepared. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Stefan Williams from the University of Sydney, who is going to talk to us about where the research is at in environmental robotics. Um, so thanks, Stefan.
Thanks, Sue. I'm going to draw on examples from my work uh, leading the marine robotics program here at the Australian Centre for Field Robotics at the University of Sydney. Um, we spent uh, the past 15 years or so developing a, a program of long-term monitoring um, with a particular focus on environmental uh, monitoring in Australia. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that we do in that context. Um, our, research, our fundamental sort of underpinning uh, engineering science research is really focused on developing platforms and, and novel sensors, um, developing navigation and mapping capabilities that allow our robots to navigate in complex environments, do a lot of work on planning and control, both at the low level to allow these vehicles to operate around these complex environments, and also at a higher macro level, thinking about how to control um, and, and think about the uh, logistics um, of these deployments. We also do a lot of work on data analytics and you know, think about how to transform the, the raw data being collected by these platforms into information that's suitable to support the sciences. Um, and underpinning all this, we have a number of applications focused on uh, supporting science in ecology, archaeology, and geoscience. And we work with a large group of partners, both here in Australia and overseas. Just to give people a sense of the sorts of work that we do um, at, a, at a macro level, um, this shows a map of, of regions that we've surveyed over the last uh, decade or so, um, color coded by the sort of science goals of the work that we've done. So we do a lot of work in ecology, particularly here in Australia, but also in Japan, in Hawaii, and uh, in the Caribbean. A lot of work in archaeology through the Mediterranean and into the, also the Caribbean and some deep water science, uh, deep sea science work, uh, both in Japan and, and in the US. Um, and we use a variety of platforms to support this work. So we, we run uh, autonomous underwater vehicles, we uh, supply sensors and sensor packages to um, our partners, um, and we also you know, deploy these, some of these systems uh, by hand where appropriate. Um, a lot of the funding for the work that we've done, particularly here in Australia, has been uh, funded through the Integrated Marine Observing System. This is a federally, federal government funded program that's part of the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Scheme. This is a program that's designed to provide the infrastructure to support the fundamental sciences in Australia. So uh, physicists get synchrotrons and um, uh, the, um, um, you know, and, and satellites and things like that um, and, uh, and observatories. Uh, in the marine community, we came together and decided on a set of infrastructure that would support the marine sciences. And this included um, moorings that are deployed around Australia, instrumenting ships of opportunity, um, providing uh, satellite tags for, for animals, a fleet of gliders, uh, contributions to the International Argo Float Program. Um, and we run an uh, autonomous underwater vehicle facility associated with this program. Um, IMOS has been about a $180 million program over the last uh, decade or so. And in a budget uh, pre-COVID, um, there was an announcement of a commitment by the federal government to another $1.9 billion of increased investment across a broad range of different science applications. So the future looks pretty rosy for um, NCRIS and, and particularly the IMOS program, which is well regarded. Our AUV facility is really focused on repeat monitoring at sites around the country. So we take our AUVs to sites all around Australia, uh, working on uh, with our colleagues on, on documenting change uh, through time in these sensitive environmental habitats. And as you can see from this chart, you can get a sense of the sorts of deployments that we've done all around the country, from the tropical regions in the north all the way down through temperate regions uh, in southern Latitude. I'll give a couple of examples of the sorts of work that we've done. So a lot of our focus has been on repeat surveying. So in, um, we did a lot of work along the, the West Australian coast. Um, both tropical and temperate regions. Here's an example where we had some bleaching um, documented in uh, the Abrolhos Islands offshore of Ger um, Geldon, um, where we caught the, uh, we did some surveys pre bleaching. And towards the end of 2010, there was an extensive bleaching along the West Australian coast in, induced by changes in the, the Lewin current and the currents along the West coast of Australia. Um, our surveys in 2011 then showed extensive bleaching of plate corals. Um, repeating those surveys showed that a lot of those, uh, those bleached corals were, there was high mortality, um, but those then were replaced by branching corals. So there's a real opportunity here to understand the dynamics of these sensitive ecological regions. And as everybody's probably heard, there's been extensive bleaching along the Great Barrier Reef over the last few years. Um, one of the things that our, our technology allows us to do is to collect not only imagery, but also 3D structural 
um, information. So we can look at the structural complexity of these reefs and see how they're changing. And in fact, at the, the problem is what we were noticing was actually an increase in structural complexity because of a change in the species composition from these flat plate corals to more branching, um, fast growing corals. So there's a real interesting dynamic here that uh, the kind of data we're able to collect is able to tease out. In, um, uh, we've done a lot of work in at Lizard Island, also up in the north of the Barrier Reef, near near where um, Andy was showing at Rain Island. Um, we'd been scheduled to be out at, at Lizard in 2014 um, when a cyclone went directly over the island, it actually destroyed the there's a resort on the island, destroyed that. Um, but my team was able to get out the following week, document uh, over 20 reefs uh, reef sites around the the island, um, and we've been returning to those sites. And in this case, we used a combination of AUVs, but also had um, divers in the water um, using a, a technique that we call a reef record, where we wrap a, a line around a pole, the diver swims around in a circle, um, and we end up with these nice consistent surveys. It takes about 15 minutes per site. Um, we do about 20 to 25 of these around the island, um, and we can get that done pretty quickly. Um, those look something like this. In the interest of time, I'll sort of zoom forward. So you can see the detailed 3D structural information that we can pull out of the imagery collected by um, this technique. Um, we've been repeating those surveys since 2014, uh, all the way through to our most recent surveys were at the end of the last year. We can register these through time. So here's a 2014 after the first cyclone. Um, there was a second cyclone went through, took out a lot more coral. And in 2016, there was a sense of bleaching. So you can really start to see the impacts of these, uh, these events, including um, uh, bleaching and, and cyclones on these sensitive reef habitats. Um, and lots of examples of these from around the, the island. And I thought I'd sort of show this one in particular. Here's 2016, 17, 18, where there's extensive bleaching. And in 2019, we see a lot of recruits actually coming back. So helping ecologists understand the dynamics of these reefs, how they're reseeded um, after catastrophic events is, is a, an interesting feature of this work. Um, I'll be interested to see what, uh, what this looks like uh, at the end of this year, subject to us being able to get back up there. Um, but there's a lot of uh, interest in these uh, dynamics. Another thing that we've provided some support for is, is the imagery that we're collecting is, is allowing scientists to document the distribution of um, key species along the Australian coast. So here's an example of some work that was published in Nature Climate Change, examining the presence of a variety of uh, invertebrates along the New South Wales and Tasmanian coasts. They then used uh, climate predictions to estimate rain, potential rain shifts of these um, organisms out to 2060. So really trying to tie the observational data that we're collecting to uh, long range forecasts of uh, changing climate and oceanographic conditions and what that might do in terms of um, range extensions for some of these um, species. And we are seeing significant uh, tropicalization of um, reefs even around Sydney. Uh, we collect a huge amount of data. There's already been some allusion to the importance of machine learning techniques. We've um, established an online repository which has now 6 million images from uh, our AUVs, which are all available online with well-published APIs and, and mechanisms for um, annotating the data and providing that, that data to our, our um, partners. We look at both unsupervised and supervised techniques for classification of this imagery and the online tools um, have hooks so that we can start to provide those services, those types of tools as a service to our community. One example here of uh, some mobile uh, classification here, we're, we're looking for lobsters. We've trained a, a neural network to recognize lobsters. It's relatively complex imagery, um, but we're able to pull out these, these guys, start to look at population census relating presence of these lobsters to the underlying 3D structure of the environments in which we're finding them. We do have to be a little bit careful because some things that are lobster-like um, uh, do come out and we have to, you know, there's still more work to, to look at how this sort of, um, these sort of tools generalize to other environments. Finally, we've uh, done a lot of work on probabilistic habitat mapping, so learning relationships between underlying bathymetry and the imagery collected by the AUVs. Um, this is work we published uh, this year at the International Conference on Robotics and Automation, um, using an unsupervised labeling technique, um, an autoencoder to learn features of the bathymetry, and then um, training a classifier to get the relationship between those um, two things. 
This allows us then to make predictions of where different habitats might occur and to also describe the underlying uncertainty in those models that will allow us to then select where to deploy the vehicles. Um, so in terms of forward looking, you know, I think uh, with our key research areas in terms of platforms, we can build vehicles, we can deploy them, we can you know, do, um, get them um, working in complex environments, getting cooperative deployments where multiple vehicles work together is still a bit of a challenge. We have good online navigation and, and post-survey um, techniques that allow us to, to get the robots back to the same part of the environment, collect, repeat data, as I've shown. Um, a lot of work on planning and control, still some interesting things in terms of managing logistics of these, these deployments. A lot of work still uh, to exploit the latest developments in uh, data analytics. And I think we've been very successful at responding to stakeholder needs and understanding requirements that allows us to work with a lot of stakeholders in this uh, area. If I look forward, I think uh, there was already, uh, I think Matt talked about the, um, the sail drone. You know, there's a number of these sorts of systems, some of which are being developed here in Australia, like the guys at OSEUS, um, looking at sort of long range deployment of teams of AUVs and USVs, the cost of ships is high. And I think there's a real rationale for, for trying to um, get vehicles that will um, be able to be deployed remotely for long periods of time. Um, and I think another interesting use case is looking at the underwater intervention case where we're starting to think about how to get these robots to interact with their environment, not just do uh, mapping. And, and Matt's shown some good examples of, of that with his Crown of Thorns work. I think there are lots of other interesting applications of that. And we're starting to work with a number of different um, partners in that space. I think marine robotics as an environmental tool is you know, well established and, and taking, we can collect huge volumes of data, transforming that into information that will inform things like state of the environment reports to government is one of the key things that we should be uh, working on as a community. And I think there's lots of exciting challenges here, things like long range autonomy, um, AUV, uh, USV designs to uh, optimize mission objectives, a lot of ML uh, developments that can be brought there. And I think increasing the operational tempo of these sorts of things. We still tend to need quite a few people. Uh, the ratio of people to, to robots is still relatively high. And I think if we could flip that around and really get these platforms deployed, um, it would be um, a huge win. Um, and I think intervention has a lot of potential going forward and lots of uh, exciting opportunities in this space. Big thanks to all of our sponsors and uh, those who support this work. That's me. Thanks very much. Well, great. Thanks very much, Stefan. I think we could have, uh, you know, spent another hour just listening to all of that and seeing a bit more detail. And in fact, some of the comments coming up on the chat suggest that, uh, you know, uh, there was a comment that that someone suggested that they don't think the public has any idea of the amount of data collection and science that's going on, and it's really very impressive. Um, and there has been a suggestion that perhaps you should make an appearance on the project. Yeah. Should we get a look at it? <laughs> sure, I'll, uh, I'll look into it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yes, if any of our participants have contacts with Waleed Ali, then please uh, yeah, get in touch. Thanks, yep. Stefan. Um, so, yes, we do have a packed program, but we will let you have some questions and answers uh, when we've finished our presentation. Our next presentation is going to be from Lashika Medigoda from Abyss Solutions, who's going to show us some inspection robotics that are being used for critical infrastructure. Uh, so, welcome, Lashika. Oh, Lashika, you are still on mute. There you go, I figured this out. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I am uh, presenting uh, from industry, so a little bit of a different flavor from a lot of the very interesting research work happening here. So um, I'm from a company called Abyss Solutions, um, and this talk will cover the inspection robotics that we do, and which also have applications in um, environmental management. So Abyss started in 2014. Um, our goal was for um, infrastructure inspection, um, so while our company covers a lot of areas, um, many things have overlap with the environment. For example, uh, dams and tunnels um, often uh, have uh, some environmental impacts along with um, various species living in them. Um, other work that we have done include uh, subsea metrology, 
Um, so measuring things underwater, uh, essentially, uh, similar to some of the work that uh, Steph is doing, but um, for uh, assets um, such as oil platforms. Um, and uh, other work we've done is with sewer pipes. Obviously, there's environmental impacts uh, depending on their management. And um, another thing that we work on is looking at uh, industrial facilities and um, there's other impacts in terms of decommissioning uh, those sort of um, industrial plants um, and um, their effects on the environment as well. So just jumping to some uh, case studies. Um, so um, just uh, the ones that I'll cover in this talk will be uh, that there's a, a water tunnel uh, aqueduct uh, system near Newcastle where there's native bat populations living in them. Um, the invasive mussel species on Intex for a water supply for uh, Las Vegas, although there's many invasive species in Australia. Uh, we've done a little bit of work with them, but this was a very interesting one that uh, I'll share. And um, wastewater infrastructure, um, of course, looking at faults there and environmental effects. So um, uh, one um, project that we undertook was uh, with the Balakira Tunnel um, uh, in the Hunter region near Newcastle. Uh, it's an active uh, waterway aqueduct, it's about 1.2 kilometers, and um, it's been identified that major works are required for this tunnel to continue water supply for Newcastle, for example. But there's also uh, endangered uh, native microbat populations living inside uh, the tunnel itself, as you can see uh, them flying in and out with this infrared uh, camera. This is at nighttime. During daytime, their activity is extremely limited. So uh, traditionally, uh, people would go through uh, during the to see inside would go through this very dangerous situation of going through the tunnel um, and uh, trying to look at the bats while they're sleeping essentially during the daytime. Um, and our solution was to use a remote platform with infrared lights and cameras. Um, and, and this initial iteration is with uh, Tether Winch. Um, so uh, some of those results uh, shown here. Um, the this is the this is actually a, a relatively low resolution um, screenshot. Uh, some of the high resolution uh, uh, data here is just uh, and another issue is these bats are extremely small. So while this does look relatively low resolution, um, we're limited in uh, some of the um, the sensing that we are currently applying, and we hope to improve that in the future. But this is the kind of uh, data we're getting. Um, we get these uh, pictures of bats, which we've uh, forwarded to ecologists to. Um, help us estimate location and numbers throughout the tunnel. Um, and we um, are going, we've done it a few times now. Uh, we've noticed some changes in the populations. Unfortunately, uh, it, may, it, it does appear initially that some of these numbers are decreasing, which is something worth investigation. Um, so future work on this is to um, uh, put in a system which is completely autonomous without the tether. For example, we have a system now that um, does go through tunnels or autonomously, and we're hoping to use this sort of system in the future for this. Obviously, automated uh, bat counting and object counting, um, very tedious process, which is often manually done. Um, yeah, doing this automatically would be great. Automated engineering assessment as well, since this is an active bit of infrastructure that is being used. Um, and also change detection over time to um, really determine the, um, the bat populations in this tunnel. So um, another. A uh, case study is uh, with uh, an invasive species um, uh, for the Lake Mead Intex or Hoover Dam, uh, you might know, um, which uh, supplies the, uh, the majority of drinking water for Las Vegas. Um, so um, while there are other invasive species in Australia, we thought that this was a, a very interesting case study um, and a relatively high profile. So just presenting this one, although there are many invasive uh, cases in Australia, uh, that we have been associated with. Um, there's uh, invasive worms, for example, we've had a look at in um, the uh, Port Phillip and Yarra River. But yes, um, this is uh, uh, something that happened in the US. So we, uh, they wanted to check if their deterrent um, for these muzzles growing on these intakes, which um, you need flow to go in, uh, was working. Um, so um, there are multiple inlets, some uh, shallow, some deep. They only put the deterrent on the shallow water inlets. This is on a deep inlet, and you can see the quagga is uh, growing uh, quite heavily. Um, and this was using an ROV to do the inspection down to 100 meters. Um, so what they found was it did deter the growth of this invasive species in the uh, shallow uh, water. But what was surprising to them was actually it was still the, the growth of these muzzles at the 80 to 100 meter depths. Um, we made a 3D model uh, based on the imagery we collected to understand the flow uh, that would be capable of going through even with these um, quagga muzzles. 
uh, along with the uh, surrounding infrastructure um, and also to inform any cleaning and intervention work. So uh, future work is to obviously do um, more tetherless operations, um, again, automate engineering assessments. Autonomous cleaning is a problem that we often encounter. Um, often there's um, you know, marine growth on something that we want to inspect. Um, this, uh, in this case, the, the marine growth is the thing that we're inspecting. So um, the, uh, being able to clean that um, within the same mission uh, would be a great thing rather than trying to determine divers, uh, et cetera. Um, and also change detection over time to see if the um, measures that they're um, putting in are working. So um, uh, a bit adjacent is, um, of course, um, this is not directly um, the environment, but is uh, it's about environmental management. So um, there are negative consequences to uh, potential negative consequences for human infrastructure. So there's an environmental outflow risk, for example, sewer pipelines here. Um, so uh, we've done some work uh, within Australia and overseas as well. They send a remote crawler through, collect CCTV footage, and often go through all this footage manually, We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of hours of uh, someone staring at a screen full of sewer pipes, uh, which is not um, a pleasant experience. So this, we're looking at uh, automating that. and um, that uh, includes image level classification here, which um, looks for um, uh, what quite specific types of faults. So here are five here that are, are automatically detected throughout the tunnel with uh, quite a high um, uh, precision recall. Um, we're looking at the uh, 80, 90 percent range. Um, but then also there are cases where we look at tunnels which look completely different. We're talking about things that are hundreds of years old. They use brick, they are clay. Um, so um, often we can't, we don't have enough training data, so we might just go for anomaly detection, which is an unsupervised technique, which just allows you to see something that's not uh, what you expect, even though you're looking at a tunnel, which um, is quite new. And we're using temporal filtering to um, obviously reject false positives, false negatives, um, which is um, actually an area of ongoing research within the machine learning field. Um, so um, what we found is we're doing, giving a five times reduction in the uh, work required by the um, manual inspectors at this point. Um, so there's always still a human in the loop because we're talking about um, uh, interventions here, which you're gonna have to send in crews, you're gonna have to um, drain tunnels. So you need to you know, ha have that human in the loop at this stage. Potentially we can continue to reduce this number uh, to reduce their workload. Um, so uh, for this task, we're talking about um, future work to automate the assessment and recommendations for for example, many, many more types of faults. We did five here, 150 types of faults are exist in the Australian standard, very subjective. We're try, trying to convert that into something objective as well. Um, we're talking about size measurements as well. Um, we also wanna have an untethered robot. Again, there's, there's a theme with um, trying to do um, things in industry. You, you tended to go safe first with a tether, and then you wanna cut that tether um, if, um, if feasible, because it does reduce risk in different ways. A tether can get caught, for example. So we can automate uh, data collection with a robot, uh, automatically um, inspecting, going in for zooms when it detects something. So it collects higher quality data as it goes along. So this can, um, for example, um, uh, replace, uh, for example, this deployment, which is occurring across um, already over all sort of pipelines around the world, um, sending uh, crews down with cables. So if we can uh, improve that, that'd be great. Obviously, automated intervention, as Stefan explained, uh, intervening and doing some minimal um, works down there, if possible, uh, would be great. So other relevant projects are dam water conduits, also for environmental outflows that we've done, treated wastewater environmental outflows. We also have some current investigations in plume monitoring and environmental leak detection in oil and gas. Um, and also um, the goal, for example, for the UK um, is uh, net zero emissions in tw by 2035. One way to achieve that is robotics on platforms to reduce the uh, requirement for people um, which have a higher carbon footprint and going towards offshore, offshore wind and the subsea um, also environmental management. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lashika. Um, so we'll move on to our next speaker. Uh, Rob Fitch from University of Technology, Sydney, uh, to who is going to talk to us about mapping endangered species. Good. 
Okay, thanks, Sue. I think I'm set up. Can everybody see the slides? Great. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so this talk is going to be slightly different um, uh, flavor, um, mainly because it involves um, a little bit more of a theoretical component. So we'll talk about what that means. Um, so the advertised title is Mapping Endangered Species, but I'm I'm going to present that in a slightly broader context of um, of the research uh, that my team um, is is looking at as a whole, and that's really about um, not just single robots, but teams of autonomous robots in general, uh, action perception uh, type of tasks, and that includes things like mapping endangered species. So that's why I've got a little subtitle. <laughs> See if my okay, got it. Okay, so just a general overview of what we do. So, uh, so you see a couple of examples of different types of robots here. Uh, the general uh, question that that we're trying to answer as a group is is how can um, how can robots work together uh, to perform useful tasks that that involve um, sensing information from the environment and making decisions on the fly, so dynamically. Uh, and of course that involves um, sometimes developing things in single robot applications, and I'll show some of those. Um, but we worked in a range of, of app types of applications, so showing a few images here. Uh, of course the first one is, is what I'll get into in a second, which is using flying robots to um, essentially develop a system of robotic ecology for um, for helping uh, to manage critically endangered species. Uh, marine robotics I'll talk about, um, and even into things that may not seem very related, like um, 3D printing with multiple robots. So there's a wide range of, uh, of applications we work on. And these are all enabled by the fundamental question of how do we do active perception and how do we get uh, robots to work in teams uh, in order to do that. <clears throat> so before I get into the actual case studies, I'm just going to lay the lay the groundwork in terms of a picture that you can have in your mind as to what <laughs> a robotic system that's doing something like this would look like. Uh, I'll just go backwards. So you want to have the capability to do object detection, classification, mapping, etc. Uh, over a large outdoor area. And what the robot team has to do, or a single robot has to do, uh, moving backwards, is basically dynamically plan what it's going to do. So this is not a case where um, the robot's behavior or task is, um, is really completely predetermined. Um, it has a general intent of the task, and then what actually happens depends on what it senses. Uh, so this involves this dynamic planning on the fly aspect. And in order to accomplish that, then the other components of a, of a system like this would be, um, again, moving backwards in this diagram, uh, some way of evaluating, mathematically evaluating uh, the you could think of the value of the robot moving to a certain spot point in the in the world and using in sensors to take an observation or to look. Uh, and in the team context, that means all the robots in the team. And this, this is online. Uh, and there's some sort of task specification, meaning what what is the robot gonna, team supposed to be doing? That's the sort of intent level description that I'm talking about. Nowadays, we're specifying these things at a form of temporal logic that allows us to uh, express constraints and uh, practical things that um, that you can't do in the more traditional ways of thinking about planning and decision making. Um, and of course, because this is a, a, an outdoor system that relies on sensors, um, there's sensor data that's uh, being observed by the various robots and communicated around. So if you think of this as the kind of template then when I talk about the next applications, then you can sort of refer to this as the, 
as um, as what the systems are or how the systems are organized. Uh, I'll just I'll just take a step back now to say we know how to do uh, quite a few of these things well, and we are doing some impressive and I think uh, uh, highly significant applications with them. But this is really just opening the door to this to this type of work. There's many, many open questions. Uh, I've identified a few of these here um, when it comes to teams. This idea of how do you um, how do you really command this entire team with uh, with a single person or small group of people? And Steph mentioned this is a challenge in his work. Uh, fully agree. Going a little further, you know, how do you use nat natural interfaces or low fidelity interfaces uh, to do that? And if you're humans in the team, how do you uh, consider the human as part of that um, uh, optimization process? Uh, cases where you don't exactly know <clears throat> where the robots are through something like GPS uh, and and exploiting this volume of work in um, in machine learning that's going on right now uh, in a system like this is also a, a big open open question. So that's the kind of overview. Let's get into a couple of interesting applications. So this is the uh, robotic ecology one. <clears throat> so this work was on the cover of Science Robotics in 2018. Uh, and it's really about this problem of how uh, can robots help ecologists when they're trying to um, perform this task of, of finding animals in the wild that have been radio tagged. So image here shows uh, one of my colleagues, Deb, with a in her hand is a kind of typical way over the last number of decades that ecologists would work. It's a handheld uh, antenna, um, and then I guess what you can't see is the is a is another part of the system that basically uh, allows manual kind of tracking of a of a radio signal. Uh, and in the background here, uh, sort of bushland, but one of the big challenges is is that the human has to navigate through some very difficult uh, terrain or in order to be able to um, to localize these these animals. And for decades, uh, there's been this uh, possibility and and desire to be able to automate that through uh, the use of flying robots. And what we did was really for the first time to show that that's possible and demonstrated that with some actual um, uh, animals in the wild, critically endangered species called the swift parrot. And we were looking at some other um, other species as well. So really the, the, the key uh, advance that allowed us to do this is a technical one. This gets a little bit into the theoretical side. Uh, but it's basically the ability to um, estimate the range and bearings so the direction um, of whatever you're trying to find uh, with respect to where you are and how far away it is. And it's, it's an interesting story. So for, as I mentioned, for decades, this has been a goal. Um, and there, was, there were incremental steps, but not really the full end-to-end -end system. And what people had tried to do was essentially take that handheld system that I showed in the previous slide and miniaturize it in some way and bolt it onto a robot. So I can tell you in a word, in a word that that doesn't work. Uh, we went down the same road and we had a, a project <clears throat> that was um, uh, funded by the ARC and some, and some other partners and uh, reached a point where we said, these um, these traditional approaches just just aren't gonna aren't gonna fly uh, literally. So we threw all that away, started over, uh, designed a new antenna system, and I remember one night uh, one night in the lab, one of the students, you know, essentially took two coat hanger wires, put them on a pole, uh, and then realized, hey, we have a new antenna that works. Um, and that was kind of one of the, the breakthrough steps. Uh, a lot of mathematics followed that. What I'm showing here is essentially how, 
how the system works. So if you can see these plots, this flying robot's a hovering type. It's a uh, multi-rotor drone. So if the robot rotates in place, and the signal you, you collect kind of looks like the chart on this polar plot at the top. And from there, what we were able to do is derive a, a range of bearing with uncertainty, um, essentially by doing a type of regression on that signal. And with that in place, that was the, that was the real breakthrough, because then we could use our planning algorithms um, that we already knew about, and essentially um, what the robot can do in terms of active perception is, uh, if you sort of look at the heat map type uh, plot on the right there, um, one observation from the robot as it, as it rotates and we do this regression gives an estimate of where that target might be. You can then compute the next best position to kind of hone in on, uh, on where, the, where the, the bird or whatever it is, um, is it actually is. And you can use the mobility of the robot to do that very quickly uh, compared to a human, which would have to walk you know, on foot, um, you know, sometimes many kilometers. <clears throat> anyway, so that was successful. And following that, uh, my colleague Deb started a company called Wildlife Drones. And now this is now um, in, the, in the commercial uh, arena. And they've just... Um, done really well and applied this type of system to a whole host of different species all over the world. Uh, of course, the swift parrot that we originally um, were motivated, originally motivated us to do this work. Other types of parrots in New Zealand, um, pangolins, goannas, and, and many others. And uh, I showed a picture of the team there. They looks like they're having a lot of fun doing it. Okay, moving on to a different uh, area of application, marine ro robots. So this is um, uh, you know, a topic of, um, of Steph's talk a couple of uh, talks ago. Uh, our take on it is really on the, on the planning and decision-making component. Um, and we started into this work looking at this type of robot here that I'm showing on the left, which is an underwater glider. And what's interesting about this is that um, is that this uh, platform doesn't have propellers. I guess this one has one uh, on the end, but, um, but, but typically the, the idea is that there's no kind of active forward propulsion uh, through buoyancy control. This, this glider can um, sink and float and through its control surfaces can then uh, achieve you know, forward motion in this sort of sawtooth-like pattern. So the challenge here is, um, is being able to uh, plan a, a path over a long, um, long geographic distance for a robot like this, which is designed to be deployed for many months, uh, in a way that makes use of the, of the ocean currents. And so there's many uh, challenges in being able to do this. Uh, that are necessary to actually get all the value out of uh, something like this. Um, and we started off this work, and um, and in so doing, we've uh, uncovered a, uh, some very interesting theoretical problems. So I'll just talk about a couple of them. Start off with the idea of just how do you how do you plan a path for this uh, for this type of robot, or really any any type of robot that's affected by uh, ocean currents like this. Um, and the key challenge is this. So we got into this um, after some work that we did with Qantas to, to design and build a, uh, a flight planning system in, in commercial aviation. And that was very successful. And um, while Qantas was still flying, they're not doing too much flying these days. Uh, but when they did, that, that system um, was saving um, a significant amount of money uh, per year for, for Qantas, very successful. And so the idea is, was that, well, we can apply the same things to um, much smaller vehicles, also in a, in a flow field, but under the water. And the key difference is that very small platforms are affected by the currents um, in a significantly greater way than large commercial aircraft are. Uh, 
because their their relative velocity is so slow compared to the speed of the current. So it's almost as if this, if you liken this platform to a commercial aircraft, it's almost as if if the if the airplane uh, encounters a uh, a strong headwind, then then it would stall or get blown backwards, uh, or a strong crosswind that would sort of blow it away from its destination, and you never get there. So that sounds cataclysmic, but that's the, exactly the situation that these platforms face uh, underwater. So what we've done is to come up with some uh, new theory on how to think about um, planning in flow fields like this that, that exploit some ideas from fluid dynamics. Um, one of those is um, this idea of streamline uh, planning. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, the, there's an idea called a, uh, a stream function that you can that you can compute over a flow field and the level sets of that function of streamlines. And it turns out that that's quite useful for uh, efficient planning over very long durations. So when doing field tests, it turns out that the the current estimates that we have um, at the scale required for small vehicles are not um, very accurate. And that leads us into you know, another open question. So one of the things we tried to do then in, in field deployments um, is to estimate um, the local current based on the drift errors. So I think this so in a, in a different version of this slide, we have moving moving pictures. But essentially, what we did was um, attempted to drive the glider in a, in a in a pattern, which it was not able to do based on its its uh, estimates. Um, but by observing the errors and using a, um, a clever use of a of a regression uh, tool, uh, we were able to online estimate what the currents actually are and then get accurate navigation. And given those kind of components, it's quite exciting because then really that, that opens up um, the possibility for doing uh, really useful active perception tasks. Here's one example that we uh, did with um, commercial uh, underwater glider operator uh, in looking at the source of a, of a gas plume. Uh, and this is based on actual data that was collected from, from a robot. Um, and we showed that uh, using methods that we've developed in, in addition to the active perception work, um, then we can very efficiently move the platform in such a way that we can estimate source of um, a methane leak, for example, um, much faster than if you try to do a, an exhaustive search or um, back and forth plot, um, pattern. So finally, onto the something with multi-robot. Um, this is a project that we're doing with that was doing with Steph at the moment, and we're looking forward in October to a nice trip on um, on a research vessel called the Falcor, uh, operated by Schmidt Ocean Institute, where we'll take all these ideas I talked about in marine robotics and try to apply them to a team of small um, small um, marine robotic platforms. Um, that will work together as a team. And I think that's all we have time for. Thanks, Sue. Thanks very much, Rob. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, I'm getting a comment that uh, everyone who's presented is clearly having way too much fun. <laughs> um, so, it, you know, it's interesting. Um, it's not actually a question, but it was interesting that we ended up with such a, a marine um, uh, focus of many of the presentations. And I guess, uh, you know, one question for everyone is, is that reflective of where we're at in terms of being able to um, overcome some of the challenges of that environment so that we can deploy robots um, to look at environmental challenges there, perhaps a, a bit more easily than on land? Does anyone have a view on that or was it just uh, fortuitous circumstances? Well, I can, I can uh, take a stab. So I think that the, I think the ocean, it really represents, you know, such an unknown 
territory. Uh, so little is known um, about about so many aspects that it's just a uh, it's a very rich area in terms of being able to do things with robots that we can't do any other way and have not been able to do. Uh, so I would say it's more of an opportunity than a than really the capability. Um, in fact, it's driving new new theory. So I think it's um, you know it's the it's the promise um, rather than the available capability of robots. Right. Thanks, Rob. So some questions from the audience. Um, this one came up when you were talking, Stefan, and that was around whether there's a centralized geo database with access to cloud analytics. Um, certainly all the data collected by IMOS is managed through the Australian Ocean Data Network, um, so AODN, which is a facility funded partly through the IMOS program. So they're responsible for um, maintaining a repository of all the data uh, funded through or collected through IMOS funded program. So they collect all the observations from ships of opportunities, uh, moorings, uh, and all that data is available um, with uh, APIs so that you know, you can download the data or you can get to it algorithmically as well. So depending on what tools people are using, um, all that data is available. Uh, I think with our image archives, we now have order it, a million annotations um, of on in excess of 6 million um, images. All of that's online uh, and accessible. Um, I know there are other big data archives. CMAP Australia maintains big bathymetric um, uh, archives, Geoscience Australia maintains big archives as well, which are all available um, for the community. Um, so a lot of this data, yeah, there, there's a real focus on making all of that available to the, all that data available to the community. Thanks, Stefan. Uh, another question which came up, uh, Lashika, when you were talking, and that is, do providers all develop their own autonomous algorithms or are open access libraries available? Uh, of course, uh, you have to look at the licensing available for those open access libraries, but we do try to use obviously what is available where possible. Sometimes we are implementing things uh, from scratch. Often, um, uh, we yes, we do a mix. So we do uh, use a lot of uh, things available if the uh, license allows commercial use, and then um, we would uh, potentially add on top of that if possible. Yeah, so a mix. Thanks, Lashika. Should I just add to that, um, Sue? Yeah, so, sure. So there's also another bit of an issue that we're starting to head up again. Some of these systems are becoming so capable in their perception and action that the algorithms are starting to hit up against the dual-use goods list. So um, some things that you want to make open source will actually become a, a restricted item on the defence. Um, so in underwater robots, for example, some some of those are uh, that's why you won't see too much on on that at the moment. Yeah, oh, that's an interesting point. Thanks, Matt. Um, and I guess that feeds into the next question, um, which was around, uh, you know, what can be done with data sharing and data linkage? Is there value in sharing data along with classification models and annotations? Anyone want to take that one? Uh, let me jump in. Um, certainly the work we're doing with Vertigo 3 is anticipated to result in uh, an open source resource uh, and even an open source hardware model. Uh, the glider at the moment is capable of collecting a terabyte of information a day. Um, in our two hours and five minutes around Llewellyn Reef, I think we collected 115,000 five megapixel images. and. Uh, and of course, we were interested in one thing at the time, which was crown of thorn starfish and their feeding scars. But of course, there's hundreds of other species or species associations, habitat um, uh, structure issues, change over time issues that could be gleaned and mined from that data. So uh, I, I think in a general sense, there is still this issue of uh, we can bring that data back and upload it to an ass and it's available somewhere or however we do it. But imagining how the how the scenario looks in another say three years or five years or if there were 
if there were five vertigos on the go by Christmas and we're logging five terabytes a day, the information uh, volume there is absolutely enormous. Uh, and I think it does pose some, some issues for um, this underwater robotics community in particular. Thanks very much, Brett. So we did uh, sneak into a bit of our Miro board time, but don't panic people because we will keep the Miro board open. So if you don't get your chance to put, throw sticky notes on all of the bits that you would like to, um, you will have the opportunity to once this workshop is over at your leisure. But to explain how Miro works, uh, I'd like to invite Andrew Scott, uh, who is the Managing Director of Queensland Robotics Cluster and our Robotics Roadmap Miro Board Master to give us an outline of how the Miro Board process works and how you can participate. There you go, got myself off mute. Thank you, Sue. Um, and. Uh, um, welcome everybody and thank you for some fantastic um, presentations today. They were awesome. Um, I'm definitely um, need to focus my efforts on, on marine um, environmental robotics. Um, anyway, um, Miro. So just give you a quick uh, overview of Miro for those of you who have not used it. So I'll just orientate yourself uh, on the screen. So on the left hand side is, a, is the toolbar. The toolbar with the little pointer at the top. Um, that's uh, uh, your, I guess, your, your, your toolkit. Um, so you can take a sticky note, you can choose a, a, your favourite colour, and you can place it on the board. You can put your idea. Um, one little trick um, for young players is that uh, it remembers the last action. So all you have to do is double click, um, and it does the, the last action that you did. Um, Sue mentioned a survey. You'll find the links to that survey just at the bottom of these, this introduction um, piece. Um, and so you can go and um, click on that and, and execute the survey. Um, we've got just some general information. Uh, in, the other thing I should um, point out is uh, if you are in a session um, with lots of people and you find the zooming or zooming around of, of all the um, uh, people's names, if you want to turn that off, you can do so um, just here um, next to the icons of the um, of the people. But I like to see who's on the board, um, and so uh, I do like to see that. There is down the bottom a bit of a, a, a master map, so you can move yourself around the board. Um, now on this board today, I've uh, and hopefully I've captured everybody, but every um, speaker has uh, essentially a, um, a spot um, so you can put a comment. Um, in fact, I think I, I asked Matt a question around, he, he didn't speak about it, but there was what looked to be an explosion. Anyway, he since told me that it was some volcano work that he was um, doing. Um, so each of speaker, um, and apologies, um, uh, uh, there I, I didn't have the name for, for the uh, industry, uh, so you'll forgive me um, for that, but there's a space to, to put some questions if you have any questions for the speakers uh, that spoke today. Um, the, just to also talk around some of the objects that we've got on here, this is really trying to brainstorm what should be in the chapter. So we've got a bit of a brain um, map in terms of what sort of key aspects. And I see that while people have been talking, uh, people have been adding to it. Uh, in order to add to this, you just click on the, the node and you can add another node and then you can type anywhere where it says type something. Um, now, zooming out, I've also got um, below where I started, there's a big piece here. If you've got key documents or any information that you want the co-chairs to have access to or any reference material, there's a spot to, to place that and you can upload um, from a variety of sources um, off the left-hand menu. Now, the other charts that we've got here, and it's been used for the other um, chapters as well, We've got a bit of a technology roadmap, um, and this is uh, essentially, you know, what are some key technology aspects right now, uh, and what are five years, 15 years, 30 years that you envisage um, that is either needed or, or is, um, is already being planned or is what you expect to happen. So if you've got ideas on that, I think, uh, you know, place them using the sticky notes. Um, and then finally, uh, and I can see some people have been using this, um, there's a bit of a SWOT um, analysis um, uh, in terms of 
you know, what are some of the, the uh, key factors that we should be considering um, when thinking about this chapter? Uh, so what are the, some of the political um, factors? Um, obviously, uh, a number of uh, speakers spoke about some of the um, fairly significant support um, being provided by government um, and other groups. So there's some key pieces around the political factors. There could also be some negative trends there that we need to consider. Um, the economic factors, um, uh, technology factors, and then finally social factors, um, especially around you know key um, uh, I guess environments like Great Barrier Reef and, and other sensitive areas. There's definitely a social factor uh, around that. So um, anything that you think um, can contribute to the the um, the writing of this chapter for the roadmap, uh, I do implore you to uh, to place it. And like Sue said. We're going to keep this board open, um, and so uh, when you come back, you'll actually, uh, I think you'll see on my screen, um, there's these um, areas which are highlighted in pink. That's just telling me that there's been some changes. So down here, there's a bit of an activity, and it tells me who's done what. Um, and uh, so you can actually just clear those uh, uh, those changes, or not clear them, but hide those changes if you don't want to. But it, that'll highlight anything that's changed since you were last on the board. Um, so I do implore you to uh, to use this board as a potential way to, to communicate to, to your colleagues, to friends, uh, to other people that you think um, should be um, contributing um, to the roadmap and in particular contributing to this chapter. Um, and with that, I'll uh, I'll uh, yeah leave uh, leave it open for anybody to answer. Uh, Ask any questions. Does that uh, does that cover everything that you wanted me to cover, Sue? Yes, that's perfect. And we haven't allowed too much time, but I think it's probably a good opportunity for people to um, just experiment and see how they feel about using the Miro board. And as I said, it's not going to be. We we will close off the workshop at five o'clock, but we won't be uh, preventing you from accessing the board after that. So. Um, now, I guess we will just, uh, yes, enjoy seeing some of the, the board getting populated. So once you know, I, th I should add to those um, uh, on there, um, when you can actually lock uh, objects, so there's, uh, someone's put a comment around the number of MLA and public reports available. If you don't want this moved, if you want to lock it in place, you can just simply um, click on it and there's a little lock button. So you can click on that. And that just presents uh, prevents uh, anybody from uh, from moving it. So with that, yeah, go forth and and add some content. And while people are doing that, perhaps Matt can actually uh, tell us a bit more about the volcano that was in the video. Um, so this is work that I've been doing with colleagues from University of um, Queensland around sort of a seeing what sort of happens around active volcanoes where you don't want to be, but we actually put a lot of robots in and we actually do blow them apart. Um, but um, we're also now looking at the behaviour of sharks because we're, as we spend more and more time in these environments, both underwater and at the surface, and uh, the next trip, as soon as we can travel over there, hopefully at the end of the year, we'll be looking at aerial um, based work um, is uh, looking at the behaviour of sharks during these eruption events, um, we don't know why they hang around. It's it's not a very pleasant environment, um, and uh, so it's it's quite a nice thing where we're combining sort of marine science questions, ecology questions, and technology to try and find answers to those. So it's just been great. We've been doing this for quite a few years now, and uh, if you're ever interested, just look up um, shark. And stuff on National Geographic, you can see some of the work we're doing there. So, Matt, is uh, is some aspects of your research um, been around um, the changes in acidity levels and, and things like that? Uh, no, not so much around. We we actually map that. We map we map gas out. Uh, mm -hmm. We're looking for some of the the uh, gas analysis work from there. Um, but we've been finding these sharks in that. Heart of darkness. This this stuff that's just wow. orange slime stuff. If you actually look on that National Geographic um, uh, sort of uh, video that was produced, um, but more and more that wasn't an entirely eruptive day. But we're finding them just living around stuff that if you put your head under water, you'll blow your eardrums out. So we don't know why why they hang around here. Um, it's it's quite interesting. So 
And the only way we're going to find the answers is with technology. We there's no other way of trying to, and it's so remote that you you have to be out there. So we're going to have <laughs> surface vessels, or we've already got surface vessels out there, but um, but more permanent fixtures and underwater as well. Oh, excellent. So Matt, um, you, you said to uh, watch the National Geographic or look out for a National Geographic video. Is did you say we need to search for volcanoes and sharks? Uh, shark. Just look up shark kano. A very shark kano. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> was, um, we had people from the University of uh, Rhode Island with us uh, doing that, so it was just okay. stuff that we'll, we'll wear. All right, thanks, Matt. And uh, Brett and Brano, um, we snuck you onto the agenda, you know, uh, because you know it was a good opportunity to see what you had been up to in your your field trip to Heron Island. But uh, I snuck you in, and we'd already finished the mirror boards. Was there anything that you would like to get some um, feedback on, in particular, around your presentation? Um, I think. Uh we're probably encountering the same kind of issues that a lot of people have historically had and will have in the future about um, large-scale um, training. Uh, so annotation and labeling, large-scale data sets, um, sharing of historically labeled data, um, ways of, for example, connecting with the crowdsource community for labeling. I, I will um, give a small anecdote, and that is, one of the strangest things that occurred on our trip was that a guy who has no marine science background, but he happens to be a drone racer, became the the standout um, you know winner of our labelling competition because of the way he seems to process imagery um, arising from his hobby. And I'm fascinated at the notion then that yeah. we can create crowd-based labelling around some of the challenges that come from, for example, a fast video, you know, fast moving video feed. Yeah. Um, and I'd love to hear from people who have some ideas around that. Okay. Um, do you have any quotes? That Thanks, Brett. I think that uh, Andrew is very busy uh, starting another page there <laughs> so, so that we can capture some of that. Thanks, Andrew. But we are, we just have two minutes left, so I should wrap up. Um, first, I would like uh, to thank all of our speakers today. Well, I should also just have a, one quick last look to see what's happening over in the, the chat. See if there are any last questions. Um, okay, so now I think we can leave it there. Um, but yes, please join me in thanking and um, presenters, you're just going to have to imagine all the applause that's happening in the participant room at the moment. Uh, but thank you very much to Andy Dunstan, who has had to drop off the call because he has had to actually get on an aeroplane. And what dedication is that uh, actually doing his presentation from the airport? Uh, so thank you very much to Andy Dunstan. Uh, thanks to Matt Dunbabin, Brian Okusi and Brett Kettle. Stefan Williams, Lashika Medagoda, Rob Fitch, and uh, thank you very much, Andrew, for once again being our Miro board master and, and wrangling uh, all of that different information, and uh, which will, I think, continue to pour in. So thank you, everyone, for your participation. Um, you know, we are, this was due to be our final workshop, which is very sad, uh, but in a good, it's good in that what that means is now that the writing process for the roadmap can uh, continue in earnest. We're hoping to have the first drafts of all of the chapters done by the end of September, uh, looking to have the roadmap finished either by the end of this year or early next year. Um, so uh, keep stay tuned for further details. But in late breaking news, this might not actually be our last uh, workshop because I have been lobbied to consider having an education chapter in the robotics roadmap. So something that focuses on our uh, teachers and educators. So that looks to be happening potentially on the 20th of August and we'll send out more information as the details emerge. But once again, thank you very much for all of our presenters. Thank you for everyone who has participated today. I really appreciate your time. Please do get in touch to give us your views on um, what content we should be looking at putting in the roadmap. 
Um, and uh, we will be, this is being recorded. So if you have missed any sections of the workshop, then I will have that uploaded in a couple of days and send around the link so that you can see it uh, at your leisure. So thank you everyone for your participation and um, uh, hopefully see you at the next workshop. Thank you.